Good morning. This is a panel uh, to discuss uh, the role of Catholicism, uh, the Irish Civil War, uh, sponsored by the Keogh Norton Institute for Irish Studies and the Klingon Institute for the Study of Contemporary Ireland. We're joined this morning by Dr. Tim Horgan, Professor Oliver Rafferty, Professor Roger McGarry, and Professor Cleveland McDavid. Uh, I'm Brian O'Connor and I'd like to begin our conversation this morning by inviting uh, Dr. Tim Horgan to discuss uh, his recent statement regarding uh, the need, the suggestion that the Catholic Church might, should apologise for its treatment of uh, anti-treaty prisoners, anti-treaty combatants during the Irish Civil War of 1922 to 23. Tim, would you uh, recap uh, the, the, the argument, the debate for us, please? Well, this was just one paragraph in a narration that I gave at the grave of Liam Lynch. Um, I was invited by a former government minister to give the oration. And just at the very end of it, I just noted that one of the priests involved in the funeral of Liam Lynch was a man called Father Joe Breen. Father Joe had been there since 1916. And he was only one of two priests that were there at the burial of Liam Lynch, the commander in chief of the Republican forces, which was in marked distinction to the number of archbishops and bishops and priests falling over each other on the altar of uh, when Michael Collins was, um, when his funeral was in the pro cathedral. And I had grown up um, kind of in a Republican household. My grandmother was Oh, Secretary to Liam Lynch and Ernie O'Malley and had been in the four courts and had been involved in 1916 and in her old age she would she would always say the church beat us in the end. Now she was a daily communicant um, for me it's just once a week so I'm a paid up member and uh, um, one of the few left probably in the country but so that's kind of where I'm coming from but the church's behaviour during the civil war was certainly Oh, one political, it certainly had deviated far. Tim? Yes. Okay, so we lost you there for a second. Maybe you'll just uh, pick up from deviated. It deviated really from the maybe the basic Christian message. Um, uh, but it may well have been a continuation of the um catholic churches really the catholic hierarchy's opinion of um irish revolutionary poli politics from maybe 1798 onwards um oh my grandmother would always say the the church beat us in the um civil war even before the civil war started it managed to persuade enough to create a majority in favor of the treaty um so my words a few years ago, um, I read the words of Pope Francis when he apologised for the church's attitude to the victims of what was essentially a civil war in Argentina, when really he said, you know, the church had turned a blind eye, had turned, it, turned its face to what went on, and he apologised for that. It wasn't a political expression or anything like that, but it, he was really acknowledging that the church had maybe deviated from its role in society. Um, and so I thought maybe this would have been something that could have been done in retrospect here, maybe a hundred years later, but it's still something that that rankles with people. Um, I'm, my doctor, I'm not a doctor of history, I'm actually a doctor of medicine, and I was doing a clinic this morning, and my, my speech was reported in quite a few local newspapers here, surprisingly, and um, I had two patients come in and said, you know, these were elderly people and said, you were dead right in what you said. They should apologize. The church gave our people a dreadful time in those years. So that's where it came from. Um, so the ball started rolling. Great. No, it clearly hit a nerve and generated a, a debate. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to, to flesh it out and, and discuss it this morning. So uh, thank you very much for that. Cleva, could, could you add some background based on your own work? Yeah, I mean, listening to, to Tim there, a phrase um, that pops into my head is, what do you expect from a pig but a grunt? I mean, in some ways, it's not really surprising to me that 
the Catholic Church um, was in opposition to anti-Tretiate Republicans during the Civil War. As Tim mentioned, you know, in the history of opposition to, to revolutionary politics. And in that kind of long durée, I suppose, the, the exception is that period between 1920 and, and summer 1921, when the Catholic Church does start to move to put its moral weight behind Republic, the Republican movement um, during the War of Independence. Um, if we go back and look at the some of the language that's used at the time in, in the church um, official pronouncements, the famous pastoral letter from October 1922, but also some of the things that parish priests are saying from the altar, and um, it's clear that there's a highly emotive um, discourse that is being brought to bear um, on, Repub on the Republican movement. Um, some of the language is quite surprising. Um, the De, De Valera and Erskine Childers are described as men of alien blood who are leading, um, you know, good, decent Irishmen astray by a parish priest in Killarney. Um, a priest in Cork Cathedral said that Republicans were human vermin to be crushed out of all exist out of out of existence by all decent people. Um, so how do we explain this kind of excessive language? I think there's um, it's an emotional response. It's a response of fear to what they see as the anarchy that is being threatened by, by the Republican movement. And one of the things that I think we have to bear in mind is that for much of this period, say from April, Mar May 22, up to even up to September, October 1922, um, the, the political wing, so-called of the Republican movement is on the back foot. And it seems like it's the men of the gun who are who are driving events forward and, and taking control. And, and that is what I think is is causing this this kind of panicked reaction by by the Catholic hierarchy. Um, so, you know, we know that de Valera has been sort of displaced in in the Republican movement momentarily by people like Liam Lynch, by people like um, Ernie O'Malley, Liam Mellows. Um, it's not until quite late in that year that de Valera forms a Republican government and, and starts to kind of reassert some of his control. So I think that that period of, of drift, which looks like a period moving towards militarism, helps to explain some of those um, extreme reactions. Um, the broader kind of international context, I think, is also relevant. The fear of, of anarchy spreading, the fear of you know godless Bolshevism coming over uh, from from Eastern from Russia from the former um, from the former Russian Empire, um, but I think kind of the deeper question is where is moral legitimacy where where is legitimacy vested in politics, um, is it in in the sovereignty of the people or is it an authority that is somehow transmitted through through spiritual hierarchy you know and then lent to the people is it is legitimacy dependent on remaining within the laws of the church and and that there are there are competing voices and competing opinions another thing which i think we should probably talk about fergal and oliver might touch on this is you know the catholic church is not a monolith in this period or in any period there are lots of different um interpretations of what's going on there's the question of the religious orders as well as the kind of diocesan clergy and um, there's the whole question of the you know the vatican who end up sending a uh, papal nuncio so there's a lot of confusion and if you look at the text of the 1920 the october 22 pastoral letter that confusion is reflected in that that is a very confused document it's not clear whether they are saying you know we have they, they claim to have that it's a matter of divine law but then there's another section where they kind of caveat that by saying, well, so long as nobody appeals to Vatican and the Vatican doesn't rule against us, then it's a matter of divine law. So it is a confused document in and of itself. Um, so this is a site of a space of contestation. Republicans are themselves contesting the church, you know, the, the hierarchy of the church in, uh, in issuing this, this pastoral letter. And um, there's, you know, quite an interesting response um, who from, the, from a, a priest, is an anonymous letter, it's in the children's papers in the National Library, who says that the bishops are worse, worse than the chief priests who are, you know, sworn enemies of Christ, but also worse than Oliver Cromwell, robbing us of our sacraments and of our priests. Um, it goes on to say that Irish Protestants must be laughing up their sleeves um, because at last there's proof that we are a priest-ridden people who have no free judgment in free things. Um, it, it 
it pushes back on this notion that the bishops have authority in political matters. It says that from Patrick to today and from Peter to Pius, Pope Pius, bishops do not have the power to settle political disputes. There is no special spiritual authority. If bishops want to engage in political debate, they can do so as ordinary Irishmen. So, so I, I suppose what I'm interested in is uh, this question of where moral legitimacy or spiritual authority um, and spiritual sanction lies as not a kind of one way traffic. I think this is a space that is highly contested. Um, and, you know, we know that, I mean, Oliver might talk about this, we know that archbishops tried to intervene privately on the question of executions. It is notable that they didn't make any public statements, um, you know, against free state atrocities, whereas, of course, they, they issued loads of public statements about Republican activities. So, um, so yeah, it's a space of contestation, and there's clearly kind of emotional responses that are driving some of the, some of the statements. Thanks, Cleaver. And uh, Ono Tourist play La, La Fela de Hill is a wonderful uh, exploration of that those very, very tensions played out within a family between um, uh, an IRA uh, brother and a religious his sister who is a religious nun in charge of a, an enclosed order. Oliver, can you bring um, some light? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I can do that, but anyway, I do have some things to say. On the substantive issue, should the bishops apologize? Um, I have to say, I'm not so sure. So by the same token, should they apologize for the fact that they did not oppose uh, the uh, Dáil and the IRA uh, in the War of Independence? Um, and despite the fact that they were called on to do so by the tablet, the English public um, kind of newspaper in December of 1920, um, demanding that the Irish bishops should in fact uh, excommunicate all members of Sinn Féin because behind Sinn Féin is the IRB, uh, which of course had been condemned. Furthermore, Father Michael Cronin, who was the leading kind of moral theologian in Ireland at the time, published a book in uh, two volume work in uh, uh, 17, 1917, in which he said that rebellion is always a crime. Rebellion is always a crime. So that, if you like, is the kind of the unambiguous statement of Catholic theology uh, on the matter. And of course, uh, this was a, a trope throughout kind of Irish history in the last 200 years, even as late as 1956, um, in view of the border campaign, the bishops say that no individual or group of individuals has a right to bear the sword against the state. And again, this is drawing on a kind of long history of Catholic thinking in the matter. Um, in 1832, um, Gregory XVI issued an encyclical cum primum, in which he condemned the Polish people for their revolution against the Tsarist regime. Um, you know, Russia uh, ruling uh, huge chunks of Poland, uh, the Poles went into revolution. The Pope condemned that. And in the Irish context, as you know, in 1870, uh, Pius IX condemned uh, the IRB, uh, the Fenians, um, saying that they were excommunicated. And that injunction was repeated in the Lenten pastoral letter uh, the sort of uh, in the Diocese of Dublin every year from that time right up, right up until at the end of the Irish Civil War. So there's a long history of the church condemning any attempts at revolution as against the law of God. Now, the complicating factor is not, if I say so as Cueve said, in the 1919 to uh, 21, but in 1916, where in the face of the attempted at revolution, only seven bishops condemned it. The rest remained silent. They did set up a commission in May uh, of 1916 to draw up a declaration about the Catholic view of rebellion. Uh, by October, they decided it was not an opportune occasion to issue uh, such a condemnation, such a, uh, a thing. The, the issue is, uh, as Tim has raised, in 1916, they did permit the administration of the sacraments to those who were involved in the rebellion, in the rising. Uh, Tom Clark was an exception because the priest who heard his confession tried to get him to say that what he attempted was morally wrong, and Clark refused to do that. So he wasn't given absolution, but the priest did attend him as soon as he was shot and gave him the last rites, which takes away all sin uh, and so on and so forth. The complication is that the treaty was accepted by all of the bishops, 
even uh, um, Bishop Fogarty of Killaloo, who was a great pal of O'Dwyer, and we all know kind of O'Dwyer's attitude. So even Fogarty accepts it. What's more, uh, Pope Benedict XV had also accepted it. He sent a telegram uh, to King George V, praising the king you know, for, for um, facilitating this and so on and so forth. So at the highest level, uh, the treaty was accepted uh, by the church. And here you have a situation whereby a minority, after all, uh, it was about 28% only of um, people in the free state who voted against the treaty in the June um, elections of 1920. So the overwhelming majority of the Irish people accepted the treaty. Now, it's true that um, the bishops tried to argue, even during uh, the War of Independence, the idea of democracy. And uh, this, of course, was repudiated by Father Walter MacDonald in his crotchety book um, on uh, ethics and war, um, pointing out that in the 19th century, when Catholicism controlled Europe, it paid absolutely no attention to democracy. Um, it is true that things have begun to change and so on and so forth. But the fact is that now the bishops say the overwhelming majority of the Irish people have accepted this. And therefore, it is incumbent upon us uh, to accept the structures of the state as they are determined by the people. One does have to say that there was too cozy a relationship between uh, the free state government and the Irish bishops. I think that's beyond doubt. Um, partly because, of course, the bishops got their way in the drawing up of the constitution of the free state. Um, they had all sorts of input into that. So that rather cemented the bonds between the free state government and the church. Um, as you know, the whole business of the Public Safety Bill of 1922 followed on, um, as Cueve has already mentioned, uh, with the pastoral of October of that year, which the Republicans regarded as a license to kill. Um, in other words, the bishop saying to, to the government, the free state, you can do what you want. I, I, I appreciate that there were differences in emphasis, but this issue uh, is unequivocal, that um, the Republicans have no moral right to do what they're doing. Uh, it seems to me that this is absolutely uh, clear uh, from, from that pastoral. It is true that individual bishops try to intervene. Um, for example, O'Donnell uh, tried to prevent the execution of Childers, for example, and Archbishop Byrne in November of 1952 um, pleads uh, with Cosgrave to um, give clemency to the Republican women who were on hunger strike at that particular time. So that in an individual way, in a, a kind of non-public way, in a private way, they did try to mitigate uh, the stand that they took uh, in the pastoral. But it's interesting that when Byrne writes specifically on the question of the women on hunger strike, um, Cosgrave, quoting the pastoral to him, says, it's not a question of politics. It is a question of the divine law. Um, the big issue, it seems to me, and we touched on this a little bit, is the issue of reprisals. Um, the bishops overwhelmingly condemned uh, the um, attempt or the various reprisals during the War of Independence that the British inflicted uh, on the Irish rebels. They are utterly silent, at least so far as the public sphere is concerned you know, on this. So at the very least, they were deeply inconsistent uh, in, in this matter. Now, it is true that um, the bishops were shocked, at least a number of them were shocked, um, in December of 1922 uh, as a result of the reprisals of four Republicans who were shot because of the death of Sean, Sean McHales, um, a number of them genuinely shocked. Nevertheless, um, uh, they adhered to their view that what the Republicans doing, were doing was morally wrong. Um, they were excommunicated and then technically did not have access to the sacraments unless they repented. Um, so it does seem to me that the main issue is public accountability with regard to their inconsistency of approach. And just to give one example, and I'll finish on this, when Dennis Barry um, died on hunger strike in November of 1923, after the Civil War, it's true, Cohalan refused to allow him a Christian burial because to starve oneself, oneself to death was to commit suicide, therefore to commit mortal sin. In grave contrast to his attitude when Terence McSweeney starved himself to death. Uh, he was given virtually a kind of a state funeral, you know, 
um, all sorts of bishops, Kohalan, uh, had the funeral in his cathedral and so on and so forth. So again, it is the issue of inconsistency, not taking um, uh, an objective moral line. It seems to me that if they are to be condemned, it's they are to be condemned uh, because of that. But at least in terms of um, the civil war, they took what they believed to be uh, the morally appropriate uh, stance uh, on the matter. On the other hand, um, I would say this, clearly by 1932, when in fact Fianna Fáil comes to power, all of these issues, the fact that you know, Dev, technically speaking, had been excommunicated uh, under the terms of the pastoral, all of these things are completely forgotten. The change of government and the bishops now wanting to keep, as it were, influence over government, amend, so it seems to me, uh, their stance uh, appropriately to keep influence in Irish society. And so often, that in fact was their, um, at least in the background, one of their motivations in the stance that they took. Thank you, Oliver. Just very, very quickly, I know, I know we've discussed this uh, yourself and myself in the past, but how do they balance the excommunication with the Eucharistic Congress? Well, all of those things are, complete, are completely forgotten. That's the whole point. Um, <laughs> now that Kev is in charge and he is kind of, you know, there and a prominent figure in the Eucharistic Congress, all of these other things were simply forgotten. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, Fergal. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Breen. Thanks for the uh, invitation to talk. I think um, I think we're in danger of a bit of a consensus breaking out on some of these uh, uh, topics. Um, I'm famously the um, British spin doctor, um, Alistair Campbell, once told Tony Blair that Labour don't do God. Uh, and I wonder if there's a similar question about whether historians do morality. I think we're a little bit maybe uneasy on that. Um, certainly few historians write from an amoral or an immoral standpoint, but I think most of us feel it's more important to explain why people or institutions act in the way that they do, rather than to stand in kind of moral judgment of their actions. Uh, and if we are to make moral judgments, uh, whose moral standards do we apply? You know, those of present day society or the moral standards and values um, of, of the time that we're, we're writing about. But I think perhaps kind of I think maybe Oliver has raised this point with his discussion of inconsistency. I think it's maybe reasonable to judge the actions of individuals or organizations according to their own self-proclaimed codes of uh, morality to identify the, um, for example, the individual hypocrisies resulting from gaps between the actions of people and their supposed um, rationales. But I'm also a little bit skeptical about historical apologies. You know, how, how meaningful is it for a representative to apologize for the historic actions of their institution, you know, a, cent a century um, earlier. I think apologies can be uh, meaningful, uh, as for example, after the Bloody Sunday uh, inquiry, where the government corrects a, a falsified and officially sort of falsified historical record, um, or apologies that are bound up with, say, a meaningful measure of um, restitution, I think can be, can be um, useful. But apologies can also function as a kind of a PR spin, particularly when they're sort of extracted by, by public uh, pr pressure. And there's actually, to my mind, I think there's been quite little research done on, on the nature and impact of apologies. And if anybody's interested in learning a bit more about that, there was a, a really interesting research project at Queen's that looked at uh, the impact and nature of apologies dealing with the troubles, institutional child abuse and the banking crisis. And you can find some of their, their findings on the Queen's website. It's, it's worth having a look because, uh, you know, we assume that apologies are important, but 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 whether they are and what their effects as is, 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 is much less um, clear. So what should the Catholic Church apologize for in relation to the Civil War? Um, well, the Church's excommunication of Republicans, its denial of um, sacraments, uh, the refusal to bury uh, the dead makes for a grim uh, history and, and almost certainly pretty unwise from the perspective of the Church's uh, interests. On the other hand, I'm not sure of the validity of comparisons with, say, Pope Francis's apology for the role of the church in the Argentinian civil war. You know, how comparable are the actions of the Irish Free State government with the Argentinian hunters' dirty war that saw up to 30,000 people killed or disappeared by death squads, and not just communist guerrillas, but students, writers, trade unionists, artists, and, and other citizens. So again, you know, there's been a lot written, I think, recently about the need for some kind of degree of measure about the nature and scale of violence in Ireland. We, you know, we got off lightly in some um, respects. Um, now, uh, uh, Phil, 
a little bit rest on talking about whether the church was right or wrong in the stance it took with, with Oliver on the panel here, because I, I defer to his authority on this matter. But it seems to me, I mean, that, that the Irish uh, Catholic Church was justified in terms of its own doctrine in condemning the anti-treaty armed campaign, which certainly didn't meet the criteria for, for just war, which isn't the same thing as saying that it was wise um, to, to, to do so. Um, and I think the church was within its rights to support the provisional government as the legally constituted authority given it's, it's very clear democratic mandate. So I think, uh, and again, I think sort of agreeing really with, with, with Oliver on this, um, I think the, um, the more valid criticisms of the church's response to the civil war relate more to its failure to publicly condemn illegal acts of violence by the state, such as the reprisal executions, which Oliver has mentioned, uh, and in which Archbishop Byrne was you know, privately told Cosgrave were, were more morally unjustifiable. But, but, but it's, that, it's the privacy that, that gives me, you know, why is he, why is he not publicly um, saying this? But I'd like to also broaden the topic out by, um, uh, cons by considering the longer term impact of this church state convergence, this, this moment of um, coming together. I mean, I think it was always inevitable that any independent state that emerged from the revolution would be characterized by, by a clericalist outlook. But uh, uh, Republican repudiation of, of the treaty resulted, I think, in a crisis of legitimacy. And Creva talked about moral legitimacy. I also think there's an important crisis of political legitimacy um, that, that deepened the new state's uh, deference to the Catholic Church. And once we start thinking about a crisis of political legitimacy, I think that raises questions about institutional power, because we are talking about the coming together of the two most powerful institutions in the new state. So, so as well as morality and doctrine, there's a lot of serious power politics involved in what's happening at this moment. And I think the crisis of legitimacy also ensures that the new government places greater emphasis on the importance of Catholic and Gaelic values to establish and project its authority at the time, but also over the next um, decades. So what was meant by republicanism comes to be considerably narrowed by the time we get into the, the mid 1920s. And the psychological impact of, this, of civil war violence on the revolutionary generation uh, was also important. Like a pervasive response to the loss of idealism uh, and disillusionment that results from the violence of the civil war is to reassert the need to restore uh, the moral order, but also the political authority of the state and increasingly to see these two aims as interrelated. So you can see why there's a strong logic for church and state coming together to reinforce each, each other's kind of um, uh, authority. It's a very powerful relationship. Um, and I think also, as with other states that experienced deep colonization in later decades, there was a tendency for the new state to draw on values that were identified with the former imperial power. So although it's you know, much overquoted, Kevin O'Higgins' famous line about being the most conservative uh, revolutionaries that ever put through a successful revolution, I think does convey how the project of asserting political authority becomes a deeply conservative one. And this helps to explain the exaggerated uh, claims to kind of moral respectability that come to characterize the Irish free state. And I think it's an important point under anti-treaty as well as pro-treaty pro governments. So, so this new moral um, order that's constructed is, is kind of consensual across both sides of the civil war um, divide. And, and the result of it is the establishment of a, of a moral legislative framework that's aimed at, at things like policing the behavior and also the bodies of, of women and uh, poor people um, and other sort of marginalized or vulnerable citizens. And I'm thinking here, for example, about the kind of the moral panics about communism um, and you know, popular culture that, that characterized the uh, interwar period. Um, and just maybe one other point I'd mention is that uh, the joint pastoral of 1922 had an interesting sequel in 1931 when the bishops uh, issued their next joint pastoral, which essentially justifies Cumnall Nail's um, very repressive public safety legislation by endorsing Cosgrave's quite dubious claim to have identified a red threat within the IRA that was, you know, potentially could, could, um, could bring down the, the whole state. And both joint pastorals throughout the 1930s were cited by bishops and clergy to justify the suppression of radical figures. So uh, Ken Loach's Jimmy Hall, for example, dramatizes the story of Jim Grolton, who was deported from Ireland to the US under dubious circumstances when he fell foul of both the church and the state. But there's a lot of other much less well-known figures who receive similar treatment, such as for example, the school teacher, uh, Frank Edwards, who was fired from his post, essentially for, for advocating Republican um, socialism. 
Um, and then I think below that, there was a much more pervasive level of self-censorship in which all sorts of people, school teachers, liberal socialists, trade unionists, you know, pretty much anyone with a progressive outlook ha had to work within the conservative power structures um, of the time. And interestingly, Jim Galton did actually receive uh, uh, an apology recently, but it didn't come from the church uh, or the government. It came from President Michael D. Higgins when he unveiled uh, a, a memorial to Galton in 2016. So just to wind up, I think in terms of these kind of criticisms of clerical authoritarianism and the very, very sort of illiberal marginalization of all sorts of groups of people in independent Ireland in the interwar period, one concern I'd have about an apology by the church is that it potentially shifts the blame too neatly from the state and from the public and puts it entirely on the institution of the Catholic Church. And of course it does so as we're in this, you know, what's becoming a sort of a post-Catholic Ireland in which the, it's, 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 it's relatively easier to place the blame there than it would have been a few decades um, earlier. And to slightly shift the, the framework, I think there's a strong case for the Irish government to formally acknowledge the illegal actions of its state forces during the Civil War. And the fact that it's a coalition government I think offers a real opportunity to, to make a meaningful sort of reflection on what was done in contrast to say, for example, the situation you get in Spain where you know, left-wing governments denounce what right-wing governments did. This would be quite a different kind of interesting context. And I'd also suggest there's a need to reflect more critically on the idea, which was really kind of historiographical, the historiographical consensus in the 1980s that the civil war was a fight uh, that marked the birth of Irish democracy, you know, that we can think about it as a, a, as a clearly kind of, uh, uh, you know, in, in those clear moral terms. So I suppose I'd appeal for complexity in how we assign blame for actions taken in 1922, but also that we consider how the impact of the Civil War shaped wider responses to, to political and moral questions in the decades that followed, I think, is, is, is an interesting question to think about. Then I, okay. just, I just want to pick up one point that you kind of finished on, Fergal, um, I feel like we've kind of glossed too quickly over the idea that um, the the own the, the democratic position was the was the pro treaty position. I think that is absolutely open to question, um, even e notwithstanding the election results of nineteen twenty two, and and that is the basis of anti treaty objections. You know that this is a document of, of, imposed by the threat of war. This is, you know, these election results are invalid because the constitution wasn't published until the day of the election. So the Irish people were not kind of voting knowingly for a political solution. Um, so, so I think, we, you know, I, I'd be reluctant to kind of go further with the discussion without acknowledging that there are questions of democratic legitimacy on both sides. Um, and, and that is part in part the basis of anti-treaty um, repudiation of, of, of the moral authority of the church. The church is saying this is a democratic decision by the Irish people. But of course, the Republicans are saying, no, it's not democratic. And here's why you can't have democracy under threat of immediate and terrible war. So, so I agree with you. We need, we need to kind of nuance and, and, and make that, make that space more complex than perhaps we have allowed up to this point. Yeah, I did just, yeah, I, I think you're, 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 you're right about that. And, you know, it's a, it's, it is a genuinely a very difficult kind of question where you can see the arguments on both sides. There clearly is a democratic support kind of for the treaty settlement. But on the other hand, um, you know, that just removes entirely the question of British imperial power, which is the, 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 the one power which can determine and structure um, and the outcome. So I, I think like what the historian could do is say, it really depends on your perspective. You know, here, here's the argument for seeing this as a, unaccountable, undemocratic, you know, attempt at, at a coup. But here's how, how here's how anti-treaty Republicans, uh, and I think it's not the job of the historian to decide which of those interpretations is correct, but just to explain that they, that, you know, they exist in, in, in at the same time, you know. Yes, but I think it is the job of the historian, of course, to report the complexities as we've touched on, but also the facts of the matter. In other words, when, um, Collins, a couple of days before the election, you know, advises people to vote for the treaty. Um, and the vast majority of people in Ireland do that. And it seems to me that, you know, despite this thing, all right, you know, Churchill um, threatens Collins and so on because of the pact and, and, and so on and so forth, um, that is bringing a, a sort of moral pressure to bear. But nevertheless, the fact remains that when the basic question is put, the vast majority of people um, vote in favour of the treaty. And there's no getting around that. And it is it is on that basis that the Catholic Church takes its stance. Now, you can say that, of course, the church was inconsistent on in that. Um, mm. 
as I mentioned, as, as Walter MacDonald um, in fact pointed out, you know, that in the 19th century it had no concern for democracy. But the fact is that when the people, when it is put directly, the people by and large vote for the treaty. Um, but, but that's not, but the church has already told them to support it. And during the treaty debates, the parish priests are, are holding local meetings to marshal support for the treaty. So right. I suppose it's a question of how free and how fair is that, is that well, voice of the people? Okay, well, guys, I, I, I just want to let Tim come in for, for one second because he's been waiting for a yeah, while. Sure. Sorry, I sorry. suppose we're kind of getting off the point here. Um, what I really brought up was the church looked the other way as men were tied to landmines and blown to pieces. It looked the other way as men were beaten black and blue to within an inch of their life. The people that did these atrocities, these were ungurriers, these were men who now did not have to obey any law of God or man. They were told by the state it was okay. They interpreted the churches, the, the, the church, I suppose, the bishops reading that this was okay. Anything was fine once the Republicans didn't get into power. Now we're not looking, I'm not looking to say the Republicans were right or the free state were right, that that um, election was democratic. It was far from it. None of the Ernie O'Malley statements that are given that I have gone through and find to comb have mentioned the word voting or election. But anyway, it's what the church looked the other way. And if that, if on the road to Golgotha, um, the people turned around and looked the other way, we would be fair, we wouldn't be here where we are today. The other thing is that the act of the excommunication was never revoked. Now this meant that men in their in the 50s and 60s and 70s went to their maker um, not knowing whether or not they were still in a state of mortal sin or not. That was never revoked because it had become an embarrassment to the church who found a suitable bedfellow with De Valera as opposed to Cosby. It rankles with the ordinary people here still that coffins of 17 year old boys would be left outside church doors that were closed against them. That, that priests who were relatives of men that were butchered on roadsides would have to stand on the walls of the cemeteries to shout in prayers because their bishop would not allow them to um, afford a degree of Christianity to the burials of their relatives. It's an absolute appalling fact that women and other um, um, Republicans or those deemed to be Republicans were refused communion at churches. That is the appalling behavior of my church, not the bishop's church, my church, the Pope's church. And I think a hundred years later, we need to correct that. With regard to hunger strikes and everything, just to quote the words of Bobby Sands, when he was told the same thing, he said, God will understand. And I think he will. But you cannot bring in dictates which are very, suitable for your agenda at a particular time and then two years later it's all forgotten about um this is really what they did with michael collins what this the bishop um the archbishop said what he did was an act of terrorism absolutely dreadful on bloody sunday and two years later he described him as a wise and courageous patriot when there's inconsistency from those who give moral guidelines then and now this becomes a huge problem. And I'm a member of a church here who's that's on its knees because it went in with the government. And in the last 10 years, the government has said, we don't need the church anymore. We don't need a moral authority. We are the moral authority. And this is this is the Ireland that I have to live in. I, I, I'm not I, I, cut, I, I want to go to Oliver and then I'll come to Fergal. No, I, I just want to say in relation to Tim that um, you see, I'm not sure that the situation was entirely as bleak as you were painting it. Yes, it's true. it was. It, because well, I have spoken okay, okay. to these people. I have spoken to their relatives yeah, during exactly. my oral history projects here in the last 20 years. Yes, yes. And even from this morning, I had two patients come in and say, I saw those few words that yes, you had sure, written sure. down. It was right that somebody yes. said it. Now, these okay. are the ordinary people, the men of no property, that most yes. respectable sure. class of people that tend to get ignored um, sure. but they okay. will they will say it to me they yes. you mightn't hear it in the academic halls but it still rankles so, so i wasn't thinking all about the, the floor i wasn't thinking so much of of the period of the civil war per se but in the aftermath of, of the civil war i think on the ground many priests were 
much more flexible, frankly, in their attitude uh, than the state position of the church during the Civil War. And we do have priests who do, in fact, carry out burials and so on of, of, of Republicans. In After. In, yes, exactly. But in defiance of their bishops. Um, and, you know, again, um, there were appalling things. Uh, I, I completely agree. I came across uh, um, one case where a priest actually broke the seal of the confessional. He heard a Republican's confession. He then went to the guardy, said, this man is coming to mass tomorrow morning um, and you know, presumably to receive Holy Communion and he can be arrested then. And that's what actually happened. That is a kind of a blatant violation of the seal of the confessional. And yet that priest uh, was not reprimanded by his bishop. So yes, I entirely agree that in individual situations and in the civil war as a whole, uh, as I've said, uh, there was inconsistency on the part of the bishops. But I think that once the Civil War has ended, uh, certainly by 1924, um, people are taking, a, uh, priests are taking a much more pragmatic attitude uh, than they did um, in the period of the Civil War itself. But morality and pragmatism aren't the same thing. No, no, I'm not suggesting that they are. Well, they were. <laughs> uh, they were. Well, there was, I, 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 as, I, as I mentioned, yeah. The, there was Im immense inconsistency, and if the bishops are to be condemned, uh, it is because they did not hold a consistent moral line in the whole period of, of the... Uh, well, I suppose there was a consistency there in that it was consistent with the church maintaining an, an elite position in society, whether it was under the British rule, whether it was under the free state rule, and in between where they didn't know who was going to rule, yes. they they ended up, well, what side will we go on? Yes. Um, and that's... Okay. I'm, I'm going to come to Fergal, patiently waiting. Um, thanks, Breen. Well, like, apologies in advance, because I know I've sort of been invited on here to talk specifically about whether the Catholic Church should apologise for the Civil War. But I have to say, as a sort of, as a citizen of the Irish Republic, I'm much more concerned about uh, that the state should acknowledge what, what it did and, and what happened in this period. And if you look at the patterns of violence in the Civil War, of course, terrible things were done on both sides. But it is the case that it's really appalling kind of uh, uh, murders and executions and illegal acts were done by the state. And that's to me raises different issues than a, a force which isn't being seen as a, as a legitimate force doing the same kind of thing. So I, I think if you look at, for example, the what's been written by maybe the expert advisory group and so on. It's very much framed in sort of reconciliation and so on, but I think maybe there's a need to sort of go a little bit further and that there should be really an expectation that the state, particularly a state that's, that represents both sides of the treaty divide, that it should now be in a position to sort of um, basically acknowledge what was done in a more kind of honest and more kind of robust way. And to me as a, in a republic, that's perhaps, you know, more important the argument than the argument about what the Catholic Church is sort of a private organization, what it's, you know, framing of, the conflict should be. I think it's a more pressing uh, matter in some respects that there should be, um, I don't know, not hung up in the term apology, but some kind of clear sort of acknowledgement of the um, what was done in the name of the state uh, and in the name of the people in, in, in that conflict. Can I, can I just, in an effort to try and wrap things up here, uh, ask a question. Are we talking about two different discourses? Are we talking about the, the, the interaction communications between the bishops, the Pope, uh, Cosgrave, the political elite? And then are we talking about the experiences, the memory of ordinary people, ordinary practicing Catholics on the ground who are experiencing this at a ritual level, at a Sunday after Sunday, at a funeral, at a baptism level? And are, the two, are they two very, very different conversations? Well, I wouldn't say they're very different uh, as a conversations. I mean, obviously they are linked, and obviously we were talking about both things: uh, people's experience of the state and the church uh, at this particular uh, period, but also then uh, the moral duty, as it were, uh, of the bishops and the pope to give uh, explicit direction uh, uh, to people um, in how they conduct their lives. Um, I mean, these things are repeated throughout Irish history. I mean, it's the same in the, in the recent Troubles, for example. Um, the resolute position of the Catholic Church was that, that in fact, what the IRA was doing was morally wrong. And this is a position they consistently argued. But of course, uh, the Republicans, for their part, uh, repudiated this and accused the, the Church of being the instrument of British oppression, one of the instruments of British oppression uh, in Ireland. So 
this is not something peculiar to uh, the Civil War period, to the Revolutionary period. You one finds this, in fact, throughout Irish history from the time of the um, 1798 rising onwards. So it's 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 not either or, it is both and, it seems to me. That's what we're discussing. Kriva, do you want to jump in on terms of emotion and memory? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about that I that I don't know much about is how this all ends. I mean, I, I want to know how the, you know, even if the, for, the excommunication was never formally revoked, um, you know, how many Republicans considered themselves to remain excommunicated their whole life or or were there, you know, is it the case that you find a sympathetic priest? I mean, even thinking about somebody like De Valera, presumably it would have been Monsignor Hagen, I imagine, in, in the Irish College in Rome, who facilitated his return to, to the sacraments. Um, so, you know, clearly there are, um, th there must be some Republicans who, who, who hold fast to that excommunication, um, who are confirmed in their anti-clericalism or forced into a kind of anti-clerical position. Um, and that's, you know, that's not to be, to be discounted, but I suppose I'm interested in the in the little um, you know reconciliations on the side that happen and how it all comes to an end um, and where it all breaks down and and I suppose the 1932 is the big the big moment when um, you know mainstream anti-treaty republicanism is reconciled is shown to have been reconciled with with the state and that is displayed and performed on a national and an international scale but there must have been steps along that way beforehand. And, and I think we could maybe, we could try and find out more about that. And just to kind of finish up, you know, there must have been acknowledging, you know, there were, you know, there was somebody in Dingle, a, a parish priest in Dingle, who allowed uh, a, 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 a National Army machine gun to be mounted on the church tower. Um, and apparently it had also it had also happened in Kilorglin, but notwithstanding people like that, um, clearly there would have been sympathetic priests on the ground. And we know that that happened during the War of Independence um, for the flying columns and the men on the run. And, and you know, and so that comes back to one of my earlier points is that this is um, a space of contestation and where you can compartmentalize, I think, and Republicans are very good at compartmentalizing. And, you know, you can say, well, the bishops are in error. The bishops are, you know, outstepping the limits of their authority. And I'm going to find another priest who will, you know, you know, who is more amenable to my, my, my political outlook. Um, and so there must have been um, kind of pragmatic, there was pragmatism on all sides, I would say. I, I could say in relation to that, if I may, Patrick um, Murray in his book Oracles of God gives us one of the appendices, a list of priests who were anti-treaty and those who were pro-treaty. And it's very interesting, there are a surprising number of priests who were anti-treaty, so that if a person wanted to be can reconcile, so to speak, you know, there were enough sympathetic priests to um, give you know, absolution and communion and so on and so forth. Um, it seems to me that um, it's true that there, there grows up then this strain of anti-clericalism in the Republican movement, people who will not be reconciled because they feel that the church did them wrong uh, in the excommunication. But anybody who wanted to be reconciled, it seems to me that there are plenty of opportunities for individual uh, priests who, who would do just that. But there, there is, of course, a hardcore, very small one, it seems to me, uh, that maintained a kind of an anti-clerical uh, kind of disposition uh, because Agreed. Of, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just popped into my head. I, you know, I did my PhD on Sean McBride, who was an anti-treaty Republican yes. who remained, yes. uh, you know, in the IRA up until the late 1930s. But he gets married in, in 1926 at U UCD Church. So he is somebody who, you know, notionally was excommunicated and um, but has managed to find an angle where he can be he can be married. And he married an anti-treaty Republican. He married Catalina Bulfin, um, who was in the four courts and um, was imprisoned in Kinmainham. So, and that was quite common in there in that kind of post Civil War Republican right. network. They were almost all married in the church. Right. Um, so there must have been mechanisms yeah. for the excommunication to be overcome or simply ignored. Or ignored, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've never really come across very many examples of a sort of the practical. Um, you know, application of excommunication has always been something I've wondered about, um, and it seems to be something that exists on the level of rhetoric more than anything else. I was just to return to your question, Breen, about are we talking about separate kind of uh, topics? I think we're we're talking about at least two separate things that are quite interestingly 
interrelated in a complex way, which is when we talk about the Catholic Church or the state and the rights and wrongs of that, we're, we're thinking about religious doctrine and political theory and so on. But when we talk about the actual impact of it and how it plays out, we're immediately drawn into issues like the nature of society, the nature of the relationship between uh, the political institutions, the, the state and society. And we're drawn into questions about institutional power. And then I think there's another level, which is we, we really need to think about the practical application of the establishment of this very clericalist state and what that meant in terms of people's lived experiences. And that's where it maybe broadens out perhaps much more widely into thinking about the nature of why you know, so many different groups were treated badly in, in, in the 20s and 30s. So it's it's quite a, it, you can start off with quite a narrow point, but I think it opens up into very kind of complex debates essentially about how kind of power operates um, at different levels of the state and society. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give the final word to Tim because he was the one who initiated the debate and he's the one who was quoted, misquoted in the newspapers and was thrust into the public eye, so. Yeah, I suppose it still has a relevance really in that um, Irish Catholics are able to disentangle basic Christianity, basic, basic Catholicism from the Catholicism that um, might be practiced or preached about by their bishops who often weren't really in tune. Um, I think they figured that their power had come from the Holy Spirit, not the Pope, not the people, but directly from the Holy Spirit. Um, and the Republicans, I'm sure, would have just regarded the bishops really as being another element really of the free state government, um, just joining another elite and uh, leaving their parishioners as it was and when things became pr pragmatic to forget about it and these dictates dictates, and pastorals just were let lie um you wonder how that is a good way to run any organization about just let things lie when they kind of suit you and preach about them um when they suit you you know it's, it's just inconsistencies are dreadful to people that we look to for moral authority. It's interesting there, you have a picture of uh, Frank Ryan um, in one of your books in the background. Yeah, Frank Ryan's sister was a nun here in Tralee, um, if not two nuns, uh, two sisters nuns in convent here in Tralee. So we're able to sort these things out um, amongst ourselves. Um, at a lower level, things are much easier to sort out. Even Civil War commemorations aren't very um, divisive here at a very, very local level, they become divisive at a national level. Um, um, but at a local level, there's generally no great problems. We can sort things out at a lower level. It's interesting you mentioned Frank Ryan because I mean, his, he's most famously known for his stance in the Spanish Civil War. And his argument is that the Irish bishops have got it wrong again, you know, that they, <laughs> by, by applying this kind of a so political, we'll political reading of a, a complex event. You know. I thought we should have got a representative from the from the bishops to defend uh, to defend themselves, but that was that was not possible. And I'm going to draw uh, to a close there, and I'd like to thank Cleva, uh, Oliver, Fergal, and Tim for a fascinating conversation. So, on behalf of the Keo Norton Institute for Irish Studies and the Klingon Centre for the Study of Contemporary Irish Politics, I'd like to thank our four speakers for uh, a fascinating uh, discussion, debate, give and take, over and back, uh, no quarter given. And uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation at a future date. But Gurum, Mila Mila Mahabir Arfad, Agusa Ganairi Liv Arfad. Thanks.